at the Office of Public Interest Advising at Harvard Law School. And I am here with my colleague, Professor Jerry Newman at the Human Rights Program. This is a joint program run by OPIA and HRP. And you'll hear a little bit more from me later, but for now, I'll turn it over to you. Professor Newman. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to be able to introduce to you uh, Judge and Professor Theodore Marone. I could fill the hour with his achievements and honors, and then you wouldn't get to hear him, uh, so I will be brief. Uh, he earned his SJD degree at HLS on accountability of states for injuries to foreign nationals. Uh, so already at the beginning, uh, setting, setting a theme. Uh, he served as a government lawyer, a diplomat, an international law professor, uh, and an international judge. He's one of the founders of the field of international criminal law. Uh, he serves as a judge in that field since 2001, when he was appointed to the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia. Uh, he served as president of that court, and more recently as president of the so-called international residual mechanism that carries on the unfinished business of the criminal tribunals. His prolific writings include a side specialty on Shakespeare and the law. Uh, and now his latest book, Standing Up for Justice, The Challenges of Trying Atrocity Crimes. Uh, that gives you some glimpse of his career and his dedication to peace, justice, and accountability. Uh, there will be an opportunity for question and answers uh, after his main talk. Uh, so please send in your questions through the Q&A function uh, in Zoom. Uh, welcome, Judge Moreau. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I thank uh, Harvard Law School for the invitation to speak to you today and to Professor Newman, to you, for uh, your generous introduction. It is nice to be back in my alma mater, albeit remotely. A modern enforcement of international humanitarian law and international criminal law started in Nuremberg. Yet, despite the normative influence of the Nuremberg proceedings, international prosecution of atrocity crimes went nowhere until the creation by the United Nations Security Council of the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, in 1993 to try perpetrators of atrocities committed in the Balkans in the fragmentation of Yugoslavia. This truly historic event was made possible by the breakdown of the Soviet Union and the attenuation of the paralysis of the Security Council. The establishment of the ICTY was followed by the establishment of other international and hybrid tribunals, eventually and eventually with the establishment of the International Criminal Court. Rapidly, international impunity of half a century since Nuremberg yielded, at least for a while, to a situation in which international criminal tribunals became an important part of international communities' response to genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. In 2001, following nomination by the United States, I was elected by the UN General Assembly to the ICTY. I just found myself starting a new career as an international criminal judge. Soon I will be reaching the end of my second decade on the bench. For a person who was catapulted to an international criminal court after a quarter of a century of teaching at NYU School of Law, the change was momentous, even existential. Academic habits learned over the years from obsessing over footnotes on abstruse questions to drawing analogies from across the universe of the law had rapidly to yield to a new way of thinking and a laser-like focus on the immediate facts and the law of the case. 
I had to move from the luxury of contemplating theoretical questions and advancing ideas about the state or the reform of the law to agonizing over the justice of acquitting or convic convicting a person charged with the gravest crimes known to humanity and heeding principles of judicial restraint and economy in my judicial writing. I had to forsake the comfort gained from circulating drafts to my academic colleagues and learning from their comments and follow instead, instead quite a solitary decision-making process in which, save in deliberations, a hearing or in a judicial opinion, one may share, share one's thoughts and concerns only with a few fellow judges and a law clerk or two at best. An academic typically engages in scholarly debates and enjoys in responding to critics. Although judges have some limited latitude with regard to whether or not it would be appropriate for them to respond to criticism of their judicial decisions, many, perhaps most, including myself, would choose not to do so. How different from academic exchanges is the constant caution and frequent silence required of judges who have to watch every word, gesture, ruling, not to prematurely reveal their thinking to the public, even to colleagues, to the parties. In other words, not doing anything which might prejudice the judge's appearance of impartiality and independence, and even risk his or her recusal or disqualification. These obligations are even more pronounced for the presiding judge, which I was during much of my tenure on the court. In deliberations of judges, the presiding judge speaks last, not to be suspected of trying to influence his or her colleagues. Even when invited to give academic lectures, a judge must be careful when discussing past or present cases or speculating aloud about future positions. And while following all these ex abundante cautelar rules, the presiding judge must know that his or her success and the success of the court may depend on his ability to lead, albeit cautiously, discreetly, to obtain or maintain consensus of the bench. The life of a judge is much more circumscribed by rules and traditions than the life of a teacher. Both national and international courts have typically adopted codes of professional and ethical conduct, which often include or are accompanied by disciplinary rules to, to ensure compliance and accountability. One of such codes is that of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. In its most recent version, it includes disciplinary rules. It sets out core principles to guide mechanism judges on issues such as independence, impartiality, integrity, and outside activities. Adopting disciplinary provisions is vital to demonstrate that judges take seriously adherence to the rule of law and that everyone, including judges, must be subject to enforcement of legal rules and principles designed to govern their conduct, in short, to their accountability. The 2015 Bologna and Milan Code of Judicial Ethics is particularly detailed and important. It contains a separate part on international judges and draws on a large variety of national judicial codes. One matter discussed in the code concerns involvement of judges 
in public debates. I note the comment in the code on the Convention on Reticence and of not discussing individual cases. However, many aspects of the administration of justice and the functioning of the judiciary are the subject of legitimate public consideration and debate. The commentary recognizes the risk of different judges expressing conflicting views in public debates. My experience as an international criminal judge has been exhausting at times. It has been disquieting, sometimes frustrating, and practically always solitary. It is painful to weather stoically without responding even the most hostile and offensive <coughs> criticism. Yet my ye years on the appeals bench, or as a president or chief justice of the court, have also been extraordinarily exciting and rewarding. And there is absolutely nothing for which I would exchange these years for. The kind of intellectual overhaul I experience in joining the international judiciary may be common for many of those who become judges in national courts as well. And indeed, there is much about being a judge at an international criminal court that is similar to the experience of serving in the criminal courts at the national level. Like judges in national courts, an international criminal judge hears arguments, sifts evidence, rules on diverse motions, considers novel questions of law, drafts decisions and judgment, and deliberates on verdicts and sentences. Like their counterparts in domestic systems, international criminal judges must put fairness of the proceedings at the centers, center of all that they do and be guided by their commitment to judicial independence and impartiality, to the transparent and public nature of the judicial process, and to the importance of reasoned decisions. In other, in other respects, however, the mission and work of, in, of an international criminal judge are unique and different from that of his or her national colleagues. At the most basic level, the cases tried by an international criminal judge are unparalleled in evidentiary and geographic scope and involved alleged crimes almost never prosecuted on a national level, such as genocide. An international criminal judge does not have the comfort of applying a penal code of long standing and supported by a gloss of interpretative pres precedent, but must rely instead on typically skeletal statutes. Hence, to satisfy the principle of legality, international criminal judges have, have had to ground their rulings in customary international law, the identification of which, due to customary laws often indeterminate nature requires a judge to exercise both discretion and creativity while resisting any possible drift towards lawmaking. Many of the features deemed necessary to the operation of the rule of law at the national level, such as a centralized legislative power and a consistent mechanism to ensure equal enforcement of the law are lucky. While I recognize that domestic aspects of the rule of law cannot be transferred, lock, stock, and barrel to the international plane and international courts, I see no difficulty in the applicability to international courts of such core principles as judicial independence, judicial impartiality, protection of judges from pressure, secure terms of service and conditions of service, fairness, due process, 
transparency, human rights, conformity of legal proceedings with human rights, public promulgation of the law, accessibility and predictability of the law, and non-retroactivity of criminal norms. In contrast to Nuremberg, international tribunals have no <clears throat> police forces of their own and are dependent on sovereign states for enforcement. They are standalone courts that operate without the legal and administrative framework found in national systems and provided by the apparatus of the state. The development of processes and rules to manage their courtroom activities has required harmonization of diverse legal traditions. And the international criminal judge cannot take it for granted that his or her fellow judges, the advocates who come before them, or the public at large, share a common understanding about how the law or legal procedures should be understood, or indeed, how a case should be managed. Judges trained in the common law and those trained in civil law come from different legal and social traditions and culture, value legal precedents and their import differently. And this difference may impact how the judges approach each new proposed ruling. Procedural and, procedural and evidential rules, moreover, have to be developed and wielded based on the harmonization of diverse national precedents, legal traditions, and a variety of models. No small challenge. Approaches to judicial precedents vary according to the education and legal culture of judges and staff, particularly law clerks. Common law trained judges and staff are typically interested in situating proposed decisions in the context of precedent. And they will usually make an effort to distinguish any case that does not follow such precedent. For legal certainty and fear of reversal by higher courts, they try to follow precedents as far as possible and appropriate. Civil law trained judges and staff tend to follow past precedents as part of the jurisprudence, but may be less systematic in canvassing past precedents. They be more inclined to anchor their decisions in a general theory of law. For all judges, use of precedents which prioritizes certainty in the law has to be balanced against the interest of justice and the need to allow for the evolution of the law. Even though the accused who come before international criminal courts are always tried as individuals, the work of those courts and the fates of individuals accused are often taken to be emblematic of broader political considerations. More than anything else, it is this broader political and historical context in which international criminal judges work, the conditions in which the court was created, the sensitive and often horrifying nature of the allegations at stake, the rank or seniority of those who typically stand accused, the ongoing struggles among ethnic and national groups fighting for the legitimacy of their own historical narratives, the conflicting visions of rights and wrongs, and the competing claims of victimhood. This explain the unique nature of international criminal judges' professional challenges. Moreover, the political environment means that decisions involving civil and military leadership may have an impact 
on a judge's prospect for the renomination or re-election, but to be faithful to the judicial oath, to be impartial and independent. Such extraneous or political issues must be pushed outside the judicial agenda and calculus. One of the major changes from academia is that an academic can and typically does take sides. Not so for a judge, who must not only be independent, but impartial and stay above the fray. Given this context, it is perhaps inevitable that the international criminal courts and their judges will face criticism for particular rulings. Of course, the right to publicly express disagreement with a judicial decision as it is an integral part of a free society and free press. And just as obviously, judges cannot cave into pressure, nor be swayed in any way by public sentiment or criticism. Extrajudicial considerations must remain outside a judge's decisional ambit. Even at the cost of risking non-re-election to judicial posts in courts where such re-election is allowed under the statutes. Yet criticism can nonetheless have a corrosive effect on the credibility of a court. Some criticism may come from those with the greatest hopes for international criminal justice and great expectations from the judges entrusted with carrying it out. Indeed, international criminal judges must often carry out their work at the intersection of a myriad of strongly held and sometimes incompatible expectations about what role an international co criminal court should play. Some stakeholders look to international criminal courts to establish the truth of a particular horrific event or to create a definitive historic record. When the court judgment, court's judgment fails to agree with a narrative of guilt or to find that a specific crime attributed to a particular individual has been committed by him, the claim is made that the court itself or the judges involved have failed in their mission. There is no doubt that the quantum of evidence collected in relation to a case is often immense, and the judgment memorizing such evidence can offer a detailed record of particular events. Moreover, for juries coming from the civil law tradition, with their investigating magistrates, truth-seeking may be seen as an essential component of international criminal justice more, perhaps, than in the common law with its adversarial system. But we must be careful to recall what is the core mandate of an international criminal court. It is to try individuals within a governing legal framework and to determine whether, given the specific evidence presented and admitted to the court and admitted by the court, the the responsibility of an individual accused of international crimes has been established beyond reasonable doubt. The demands of due process, the substantive legal requirements, the precise nature of the evidence necessarily constrain the court's findings in a way that a more free-ranging inquiry outside of the judicial process, as in the case of truth commissions, would not. And importantly, these same factors also permit different conclusions to be reached in different cases, meaning that the responsibility for a crime may be found beyond a reasonable doubt in one case, 
while evidence of the same crime may be found insufficient in another. Other stakeholders may look to international criminal courts and to their judges to bring about peace and reconciliation. As indeed the United Nations Security Council has at times suggested in establishing such jurisdictions. International criminal justice will almost invariably be found wanting by those who believe that the international criminal courts are mandated to promote peace and reconciliation, particularly where there is no evidence of any such impact or where rulings are sought to be counterproductive to aims of reconciliation. Trying those accused of serious violation of international law in a public, fair, and careful way may, of course, have a beneficial impact on the restoration and maintenance of peace in an area previously shattered by conflict. But these salutary effects should not be confused with the narrow mandate of an international criminal court and its judges to try those accused in accordance to the law. Were it otherwise, were international criminal courts responsible, even only in part, for ensuring reconciliation, the fairness of the proceedings would almost inevitably be put in doubt, as when the perceived interest of reconciliation would weigh in favor of a particular conviction or a particular acquittal. Legal principle must not be trumped by any extraneous purpose, however desirable that purpose may be. Finally, one of the most frequently voiced expectations is that the International Criminal Court should give victims justice. The idea that the international criminal justice is done for the victims is popular, just as it is contested. It risks pitting the goal of many victims to ensure punishment and retribution against those whom they believe to have committed crimes, against pitting that against the rule of law, guarantees of fairness, impartiality, and due process. If an individual accused of atrocities, and particularly one who is a political or military leader, is acquitted, or if the prosecution declines to pursue charges, these decisions are sometimes viewed as a failure of international criminal justice. But let us be clear, the true failure of international criminal justice would be if convictions or acquittals would be with you issued without support of law and evidence. If anything, acquittals can be a sign of a mature and independent legal system and of a court that is focused on the narrow judicial mandate of trying those charged rather than on attempting to satisfy the often conflicting expectations of diverse stakeholders. Even as we sympathize, even as I sympathize with the sentiments of victims, the overarching obligation of a criminal judge, whether it's a national or on the, the, on the international uh, level, is to respect the fundamental principles of the rule of law, a concept still more fragile in international jurisdictions than in most domestic settings. It is through affirming the importance of courts and due process, not simply in times of peace, but during conflicts and their aftermath. I have some problems here. Still hear you fine, Judge. Um, what do I do to? You cannot see me now, can you? We can. We can see and hear you fine. 
Oh, so what? What do I do? I, I click on join. Uh, no, you don't need to click on anything. You can okay. Your remarks. So let me repeat. Even as we sympathize with the sentiments of victims, the overarching obligation of a criminal judge, whether at the national or the international level is to respect the fundamental principles of the rule of law, a concept still more fragile in international jurisdictions than in most domestic settings. It is through affirming the importance of courts and due process, not simply in times of peace, but during conflicts and their aftermath, that we ensure that it is the law and not the rifle and vengeance that rules. And this, to my mind, is the animating principle at the very heart of international justice and the principle that has been at the center of my work as an international criminal judge. An academic can be much more eclectic than a judge. He can loudly proclaim his own social, political beliefs and practices. In contrast, judges are much more constrained in their work and even in their private comportment by accepted principles and traditions of the judiciary, typically reflected, reflected by codes of judicial behavior. Like everyone else, judges may and do make mistakes. I know I did, and at times I could have done things differently and better. But to be a judge, a person must at least try to live up to the lofty goals of the judiciary. He or she should try to ensure that the protections offered by the law are respected equally for the victims as for the alleged violators. He or she should remember that procedural fairness and due process are as important as substantive decisions and that the core judicial norm is that convictions can only be entered or upheld on the basis of the evidence established beyond a reasonable doubt and in accordance with the law. He or she must at all times protect judicial independence and impartiality, avoiding not only bias, but just as importantly, appearance of bias. It is only by respect of such principles that courts, especially international courts, can acquire credibility, authority, and legitimacy. Justice is not about achieving any particular outcome. It is about ensuring a principled process that serves to strengthen the rule of law and recognizing this, the overarching authority of the law. Not surprisingly, commitment to such principles, to the exclusion of any extraneous agenda at times, resulted in harsh and brutal criticism of some of my decisions, especially those involving acquittals and early releases of prisoners who have served two thirds in the, of their sentences for the ICTY and three fourths of their sentence sentences for the ICTR. This caused me much pain, but being a target of criticism should perhaps be regarded as part of the job description of an international criminal judge. In doing our work as judges in a principled way, come what may in terms of criticism, we are helping to ensure the strength and integrity of international criminal justice. And in years to come, I trust that others will see these first few decades of international criminal justice for what they are, a time where vital and difficult issues were confronted and where fledgling courts succeeded in making profoundly important contributions to the larger shared goals of ending impunity and upholding human rights and dignity. In concluding, let me say just a few words about the present state of international criminal justice. 
Sadly, the relations between some permanent members of the Security Council are largely what they were during the height of the Cold War, if not worse. One or two superpowers block all attempts to establish additional criminal jurisdictions or to refer cases to the International Criminal Court. After a period of expansion of international criminal tribunals and optimism about the future of international criminal justice, we have entered a period of retraction and concern. There is a huge gap between actual accountability efforts and atrocities which are not investigated and the great number of individuals still enjoying impunity. Political support for international tribunals is on the decline and several tribunals exist no longer. International tribunals lack the resources or the competence needed for robust prosecutions. And states on whom international tribunals depend for cooperation and enforcement often fail to arrest fugitives from justice. In these circumstances, it is essential that states assume a leading role in ensuring accountability through national prosecutions. Fortunately, there has been an increase in national prosecution of crimes committed not only on the territory of the states concerned, but also on the territory of third states under the principle of universality of jurisdiction or under the grave breaches provisions of the Geneva Conventions. Until the historic pendulum swings again in the direction of international tribunals, we will depend largely on national prosecutions to avoid an even greater slide towards impunity. Civil society has a major responsibility to further encourage such prosecutions. I hope that you, as future graduates of this great law school, will become the leaders in these endeavors. And I thank you. Well, thank you so much for that very insightful presentation, Judge, and for all that you've done over the last 20 years to advance international justice. So the floor- Thank you, thank you, Julian. Um, just to see you, do I click on join? Uh, nope, you don't need to click anything. Just um, I'll facilitate the question and answer section. So no need to click anything. You're you're fine just as you are. Except that it would be nice to see you. <laughs> so we okay. We, just go ahead. Okay. So we do have one question from the audience. Um, in your personal experience as an international judge, have you encountered moments? where the different legal traditions of the judges were in conflict with one another? Or did the hybrid form allow for this to be avoided? Yes, I am. of course I encountered problems where judges from the civil law tradition and common law traditions would have different approaches. But it's interesting how those things have over time uh, given the goodwill and the competence of the judges, have uh, have worked out. Let me give you one example, our rules of procedure and evidence. When we have started, um, the tribunal, as you know, was established in 1993. It was um, became operational rather in 1995. At that time, the rules of procedure and evidence were really almost purely common law based. Over time, over, over time, we have discovered that there are certain features of civil law which would make our work much more efficient. And we have in fact, although um, we have seldom discussed this in these terms, if you read our rules of procedure and evidence now, you will see that with regard to procedure, we have often, we, see, we are still largely faithful to an approach based on common law. As regards evidence, we more and more follow 
It's a very low concept. Uh, so um, our openness, for example, to written testimony is much greater. From the beginning, we would not follow the hearsay principle, which is so central to the um, uh, common law rules of evidence. So we have um, incorporated over time many concepts of civil law, which produced more efficient, efficient management uh, of the courtroom in French or in civil, um, civil law court in general, uh, judges perform a more, much more robust, active role in managing courtrooms. Uh, in uh, common law courts, uh, judges are um, uh, more, um, uh, play more a role of a neutral umpire almost, not entirely, but somewhat. So in all those respects, we have tried to incorporate um, rules of or, or rules or concepts of common law, which produce a more um, a, a civil law, which produced a, a, a more, um, um, which gave us more tools to more robust and efficient management of the courtroom. Thank you. Another question? Another question. In your opinion, what is necessary to swing the pendulum of public opinion back in favor of international criminal prosecutions? Or do you see universal jurisdiction prosecutions as the future of accountability? For well, first of all, universal jurisdiction, which I've already mentioned, where, where we see where we see some some progress. Um, the uh, Pro progress on, uh, on the swing of the pendulum would largely depend, of course, on uh, politics, politics which still guide very largely um, the activities of the UN Security Council. Uh, when uh, new approaches to establishing jurisdictions or pressing for accountability in a particular set of atrocities are sure or almost sure to attract a veto of one or two superpowers. We cannot be sanguine about uh, about progress. But civil society is extremely important. Uh, press is very, very important. Um, um, there are hardly any countries that can completely ignore sentiments and uh, of the majority of public opinion. So public opinion leadership, um, uh, um, religious leaders can play a role in pushing the international community towards uh, um, the pendulum turning again in the direction of international criminal tribunals. But I would like to come back to a sec for a second to the question of national prosecutions. International tribunals will never have the necessary resources and often will not have the necessary jurisdiction to deal with the tremendous number of atrocities which are being committed and with the tremendous number of persons who are not being investigated, certainly not prosecuted for the acts which they are alleged, for the crimes that they are alleged to have been committed. And therefore, we must have a partnership, a greater synergy between international criminal tribunals and domestic jurisdictions. National uh, jurisdictions have um, greater resources than we have. And if they rely more actively, more robustly on principles of universality of jurisdiction, if they invoke more often the grave breaches provisions of the Geneva Conventions, which, uh, um, uh, which really very largely grant the right and even perhaps an obligation to states to prosecute certain violations of international humanitarian law, which have been committed even outside of the boundaries of those countries. We may see some progress, but universal of jurisdiction and Glad that the person who asked this, que this question came back to it. Uh, is something where we 
have been making progress. And if you look at the number of countries in Europe, if you read about countries such as Germany in the United Kingdom and how often they resort to prosecution of persons who have committed crimes outside of the territory of that country, you will see that we have been making some modest, perhaps often below the radar progress, but progress nonetheless. Wonderful. Thank you. Another question from the audience, and this comes from uh, your, your colleagues in Oxford who send you greetings. Uh, so you have been a judge in many of the most impactful cases in the field of international criminal law. These cases have fleshed out in important ways the elements of crimes and modes of liability. Could you share, Judge, the legal question that you have found the most challenging to answer or uh, the rule um, on which you, you found hardest to identify in your career as a judge? I would have to reflect on that. I, there were quite a few of these. <laughs> Take your time. So I, I think I will pass. I'm gonna pass on that, that's fine. So another question is, you spoke about the difference in approach between judges and academics. What do you think that academics could and should learn and adopt from the way that judges approach the law? Well, um, I pointed out to the fact that judges in contrast to academics have to have um, more of a laser type vision of the facts and the law. Academics have the tendency to be all over uh, the universe uh, of the law. And uh, I think that uh, perhaps what we can learn, we as academics can learn from judges is that uh, um, we should also look more specifically at the case um, uh, which we are discussing, more at the evidence uh, which is uh, underlying that case, um, more at the law which is uh, um, relevant to that case. In other words, perhaps to have a some, from time to time, a somewhat narrower focus on a case, but a deeper focus. But um, uh, I think the judges uh, can learn from academics as academics can learn from judges. It's, it's interesting uh, when I'm, one of the things that struck me in the way the judges view academics has been that um, in criminal courts at least, uh, uh, judges often elected as presiding judges or presidents of courts, people who did not have too much judicial experience prior to coming to the court and came as, an academic, as academics. And one of the great advantages, of course, of academics is, um, is the, the breadth of their approach to the law and open-mindedness um, about the generality of the law. And again, this uh, has to be reconciled in many cases with the sort of uh, narrower, in-depth, in-detail vision of a judge. Our next question comes from someone who is a judicial law clerk working at one of the ad hoc international criminal tribunals. The is being actively frustrated by the state involved. What can international judges leave in such a situation where no realistic progress can be had? And what can we do for the future of international criminal law? Uh, can you repeat just that um, part frustrated by what? is being actively frustrated by the state involved in the prosecution. So what legacy can international judges leave in such a situation where progress is being uh, frustrated by, um, by the state? Um, I, I wish um, your questionnaire would be a tiny bit uh, 
uh, without the revealing necessarily the name of the state, a little bit more specific about the issues? Um, perhaps you can comment on um, when a when a state um, is well. Maybe we'll, we'll, let me skip that one and come back to it. Um, another question that we have from the audience is, um, since you have experience with evidence in an international setting, how do you think evidence that is being collected by new investigative mechanisms would be used in future prosecutions in international criminal tribunals? And there's a comment from, from this, um, this person saying, I'm afraid that such evidence would provide itself for uh, would provide itself in the first stages, um, would be helpful in the first stages of the proceedings, for example, um, for arrest warrants, but would encounter a lot of issues at a later stage. So can you comment a bit on the evidence that's being collective on new investigative mechanisms and how they might be helpful when it gets to the prosecution stage? Thank you. Thank you, Julian. The one of the problems with regard to evidence is that the international criminal justice happens often, too often, many years after the events have occurred. So perhaps the greatest problem that I see in evidence, which is presented to us in international criminal courts, that the evidence uh, um, has been collected so many years ago that if we need someone to present that evidence orally before the court or to be available for cross-examination, very often the persons concerned are no longer um, around, no longer available. Um, uh, in this context, because it takes so long often for a case to come um, in fact, to be um, to come to a court, uh, and many years have can pass in the meantime. We very much need those new mechanisms to deal primarily with the collection and the preservation of the evidence, and we need specialists for that to make sure that that evidence has not been contaminated by, um, uh, by in, in using it in a way that would in fact compromise its being able, its availability to be used as uh, important evidence in future prosecutions. Therefore, I think that those new mechanisms that have been mentioned um, um, are very, very important because we do not have an answer to the need to, we do not have a solution to, for producing evidence quickly in proceedings which would happen quickly. That evidence would often be stale and years would pass. And if no new mechanisms would be established to collect and to preserve the evidence, we really would not be in good shape. I mentioned the fact that uh, after a period of blossoming of international criminal tribunals, we are now in a period of retraction. So in fact, it has become more difficult, not more, not easier to produce evidence quickly before a judge. Great, thank you so much. So we're just about at the hour and I know many class at one o'clock. So with huge thanks on behalf of everyone who participated in this event, the Human Rights Program and the Office of Public Interest Advising. Judge, thank you so much for the time that you've taken to share your wisdom and insights with everyone here today um, and for all that you've done over your distinguished career. And thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Julian, and thank you, Gerald. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.